And as Larry said tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about photos. And the reason I'm doing it this way, talking about photo preservation, and then a little bit about memories, is that it's amazing how many times I've gone to talk to people about putting memories in family search, and they have no concept that they have to digitize the images before they can be put in there. So I thought, well, this is a good time to maybe do a little presentation where we can um, go through some of the steps for setting up your pictures to get into family search as memories. And so that's going to be the focus of this, along with some other things about memories themselves. So tonight we'll, we'll cover gathering your items, digitizing them. We'll talk some about. Uh, we'll talk somewhat about uh, enhancing the photos. Up and then uploading them, different ways to upload them into memories. And then in the memory section of this, we won't do a full coverage of memories, but I want to talk about, you know, pictures versus documents, adding audio to images, a couple of these extra little things, how to get a video into memories, even though we really can't put videos in there. And then talk at the end about a topic that'll probably get me in hot water with Salt Lake. That's why I put it at the end in hopes that they won't listen all the way through. And we'll talk a little bit about public versus private uh, images, memories, and how you can set this up so that these memories can be usable after you're gone. And so these will be the things that we'll cover tonight. It looks like a long list, but it's really not as bad as it looks, I don't think. We'll see how it goes here. Okay, so gathering your memories. For many of us, this is what our genealogy looks like. Actually, I hope it isn't what it looks like, but unfortunately for some of us, it is kind of the way our, our family search or our family history is organized. Now, everything that you put into family search has to be digitized. That's the bottom line. You can't get it in there unless it's digital. And so we have to get some order out of the chaos so that we can actually do something with it. We need to create digital images and then organize those images in a way so we can find them quickly. And then if we wanna keep paper, the paper records, take them after they've been digitized and let's put them in a box or some kind of a filing system where there's a pattern so that you can find them. So I know there's a lot of people, they put this off and it's just one of those things that really ought to be done. And if you're gonna digitize, that's a good time to actually get everything organized too. Okay, digitizing used to be, that meant you needed to have a scanner. And so on the left there, I've got an HP, flatbed scanner, it's an all-in-one unit that prints and scans and faxes and all those things together. But essentially it's there for the scanning portion of it. It used to be if we talk scanning, that's what we had to do. 10 years ago, that was the way you scanned. You either had an all-in-one type device or you had a standalone scanner. And those scan scanners scan at different qualities of images. If you use something like that, and you're going to make images of pictures and things like this to put into memories, you really need to pay attention to what they call the DPI, the dots per inch resolution that the scanner is scanning at, because it can scan at different resolutions. If you're going to use a scanner, make sure you bumped it up to the highest scanning level it can do. Usually that's probably 1200 dots per inch DPI. Oftentimes it's set the, the, the uh, default is 600 or 300, but you want it to be six or 1200 if you can. What happens with a, anything that's scanned is it's made up of all these little dots inside an inch, square inch. And as you enlarge things, it becomes what they call pixelated. It turns into those dots. Instead of being pictures, you see all these dots. And so the, the more dense they are, the longer it takes to 
make them go to pixels and it makes the image a better image. As you try to enlarge it, uh, a scanned image, it turns to pixels. And that's, that's why I don't like to use scanners myself. I use the second technique, which is to use a phone or a camera and take digital images. Our cameras today on our, our iPhones or our Motorola's or whatever they might be, in our smartphones are so high powered that they're far better than most cameras that we used to own. All these fancy expensive cameras we had in the past weren't as powerful as these cameras that are in our phones today. They are perfectly fine for taking pictures for images that we're gonna put into family search. You can actually buy a scanning app or get a scanning app to put on your phone. So it turns it into a scanner. Unfortunately, most of the time they come free, but they have what they call the um, payment within the, the service. So once you get into it, you find out, well, you can you can scan 10 images and then after that you have to start paying for them or something like that. But you really don't need that. The camera alone, the, the, the camera in your phone alone is sufficient. And most of us know how we can move those images off our phone to our computers or other storage devices. And we've got these images for good. So it's really, it's really become a lot easier to do nowadays. And we'll even talk about the uh, memories app and taking images with that a little bit later, which is probably the simplest way to get images over into family search. Okay, the other thing we ought to think about a little bit is, is capturing images from web pages. A lot of people want to be able to do that. They see, especially something like us, they find a grave. They see a tombstone there and they want, a, they want a copy of that picture. What you have to understand is that oftentimes you can just go to the web page and do a right click on an image and it'll let you copy that image. The trouble is the images that you see on a web page tend to be what I would call dummy down. They're, they're simplified, they're less uh, dense an image than a normal image would be because they're trying to save um, the amount of, of memory it's gonna take to build the web page. So they don't have you know fully uh, complex images on the screen. They look okay on the screen because they're set to look okay there. But if you take them off of there and then try to print them out in six by four by six, maybe size or larger, you're gonna find the picture is not gonna look very good. And so we, we need to understand that when we're looking at these pictures and since we use Find a Grave, that's a great website because we can actually get to the original picture that was given to Find a Grave. Because when you look at the, at the web page, those images that you see there on this particular person's memory, there's a front and a back image. Those are the dummy down images. Those are the ones that if you copy them, and then print them out, they're not gonna come out too good. What you can do at Find a Grave though, is you can click on that image. And when you do it, it turns on to another page where the image is blown up. It's still not the highest quality image yet because on that screen, there's a little thing down at the bottom that says view original. And if you turn that, if you click on that, you will get the original image that was sent to them. And you can do a right click and then copy that image and you will have the high density image that you want. And that'll be the best version of the image for what you're gonna wanna do, which is maybe print it out or put it in a book or, or whatever you wanna do with it, it'll be the best quality image. Now, the one thing we're not going to talk about tonight is copyright permissions. Now, I can do these because, as you notice, it says photo added by Robert Givens. I took the pictures, so there's no issue there. But you really should be getting permission from people when you're taking pictures off the web. But we're not going to go into that issue tonight. Just be aware that it's there. 
Another side light to this is sometimes you run across PDF documents. You'll actually find many of them in, in, in the memories at Family Search. The problem with that is the images that are in a PDF document are not their own image. I mean, they're not separate from the document. They're part of the document. The whole document is now an image. And so to get the actual picture, you're going to have to do something. Technically, you need to cut it out of that PDF document or what we would call snip it out. And so if you have a, a Windows machine, there's a program called snip it. And you can turn snip it on after you get the image on your screen where you can see the whole image. You then just press Windows, Shift, and S at the same time. And it turns the screen kind of dark like you see here. And on that screen will appear a little white cross or a little white. It's actually a plus symbol is what it is. You can take and then move that symbol around to one of the corners of the picture you're trying to capture. And when you do that, then you take and put your mouse on the on the cross or the plus sign and do a um, left click and drag it diagonally to the corner at the diagonal end of the picture to the opposite corner of the picture. And when you let go of the mouse at that point, it will the, the program will then snip out the picture that you framed and put it on your clipboard. And at that point, you can then go wherever you want to go and do a paste of that image. And you'll have a copy of that image. And so that's a way to get something out of a PDF file. This is what I got from this PDF document, which was a life story of my grandfather. This is a picture of my grandfather and my grandmother and my dad. And so I was able to snip it back out of the PDF file so that I now have an image of that picture. Now, there are other programs that do the Scribe, Snagit, Earfin View. There, there's a bunch of different ones. I know there's one for Apple. And right now, my thing about the, the meeting covers that up, so I can't remember the name of it. But um, it's on the screen there. You can use those programs and they do pretty much the same thing. The bottom line is it allows you to take from the web an image that you couldn't get any other way and just make a copy of it and then take it and put it wherever you want to put it. That's where I get most of the pictures that are in these presentations is I snip something and then I just drop the pictures into my, my um, program presentation on the slides and I've got them. Okay, editing. One of the things you're going to find when you start using memories, family search, and you're putting images of either pictures or documents in there is what you put in there is what you get. And there isn't a lot you can do once it's in there. Once it's in there, you're pretty much stuck with what you've got. Now, they have a thing called actions. You can click on actions, but really the only thing you can do is rotate the image. You know, occasionally a picture comes in sideways or upside down. You, as the person that put it in, can rotate it around. But that's about all you can do. If you want to do other things, if you want to crop it and cut out some of the excess stuff around the sides or straighten it or something like that, you're out of luck. These things need to be done before you get in to Family Search before you upload the the picture, the image, into Family Search. So let's talk a little bit about using the camera and then using the the uh, Memories app. I took a picture of a picture that I had, a physical picture, with my camera. That's what you see up there, the sideways, which means we got to move, rotate it around, and things like that. But I've taken a picture of it with the Memories app. I just went into the app and I said, I want to take a picture. And I took that picture 
And now I need to play with it and I'll show you what you can do with it before you actually upload it. Okay, I'm going to say I want to use the photo. It's good enough to use, but I do want to do some work on it here. And so I'll click use photo. And when I do that, this screen comes up that you're now looking at. And it has a way I can rotate. So I'm going to click on that rotate button and I'm going to click it once and it's going to rotate the picture around or I'll click it as many times as it takes to get the picture going the way I want. And now I've got it going the way I want and I click on the cropping image which or uh, icon, which is this one down here where my mouse is. That turns on these little white lines and it's going to allow me to clip off rough edges. I can square the picture up. You can see that when I took it with my camera, I wasn't perfectly lined up and it's a little messed up. So I'm going to have to lose a little of the picture and to get it nice and square and get rid of the background that I don't want there from the table that I was uh, taking the picture off of. And so I'll reposition that box by taking the little corners and pulling them in or to the right, left, or up or down until I get the picture framed exactly the way I want the best I can do, which is like this. And you can see that I'm losing a little bit on the edges and along the bottom, but I've got everybody in there and I don't have any of that distracting mess that's above and below the picture from when I originally took it and off to the, no, I guess it's just the top and the bottom. And so once I get it the way I want, then I'm ready to crop, click crop, and I will have my finished picture. And there it is. And from that point, I can just tell it, upload this picture. And I have a nice pretty picture that's all framed and everything. But that's what you can do with your phone, with the memory app on your phone. You can at least do the cropping and get the picture to look nice that way. Rotate it if needed and have everything set up so that when you upload it into Family Search, you've got as good as you can do. Now that's all you can do with the Memories app. They don't have any other features for enhancing. So I would like to mention some other things. Sometimes your pictures aren't the brightest or the colors faded or they're a little bit blurry. This is an old picture. This is from back in the 60s and it's not the greatest quality of course it's a little bit bad here because it's used as a background and everything but technically what you see you can tell it's not a great image to begin with and i want to do what i can using the power of my computer and we'll find that many of the programs that you look at pictures on your computer actually can let you do some editing and so on a Windows computer, when you have Windows 11, one of the apps that you can use to view the pictures in your computer is called Photos app. It's one that just comes free with the computer. It's part of Windows 11. And so I'm open in the Windows app right now, and I just want to use their editing capabilities. So I'm going to click on the edit button up at the top. And I'm just going to click on it, and it takes me to this page. The picture is just a little bit cockeyed. It's not exactly square. And so I'm going to straighten it up a little bit by using the slider down at the bottom. I can actually grab the big white button that's in the center and pull it to the right or left. And that will take the picture and turn it a little bit until I get it the best way I want. Sometimes you'll find your picture might look a little bit like this. And if I tilt it the right way, it'll straighten it up along the sides. Or sometimes it's off this way and we can straighten it up that way using the slider. And this picture was pretty good. It was just a little bit off. So I moved it just a tiny bit. Okay. 
Next, the pitcher, actual pitcher needs cropping. So I have clicked on crop, whoops. I have clicked on crop up here. And so you can now see I have those little white markers at the corners that I can drag so that I can bring them up or down and sideways to get just what I want. And the way I've set it up, I want that white border gone that was around the pitcher. And then a little bit of the table that the pitcher was sitting on. And here's another pitcher hanging out over here. I want to cut all that off. Unfortunately, I'm also cutting off December 1963, which tells me when the pitcher was taken. But I can always put that in the, the detail about the memory. Okay, so I can do that crop. And the pitcher then will be in pretty good shape except I want to see if I can go any further along. You notice the picture's kind of in a funky shade of something here, a little bit of tannish color to it. It's not really black and white. It's not color. It's one of those kind of off things. Well, in this program, while I'm doing things like cropping, I can also do some filtering. I can click filter. And it'll give me a bunch of different kind of filters for this picture, showing me different ways to make it look. And what I did is I picked the black and white high contrast filter. And that turned it into a true black and white photo, which is much better than what we had. It's still not the sharpest images, but it's much better. And so I'm very happy with that. Okay, now that's about as far as I can go with this program. What's cool is there are other things out there that are available to us, especially those of us that are, are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We can use the power of my heritage. I absolutely love this site if for nothing else, the photo techniques. We can enhance photos, we can sharpen them, and we can colorize them, and we can do so many neat things over here. As part of our membership at MyHeritage through our church membership. So I want to show you what we can do. We'll take that same picture. This is what it looked like when I got through with it in the Photos app. I go over to my heritage and I enhance it. What that does is it looks at the faces and sharpens them up. You may not be able to see it so well, but if you look at my Aunt Lottie here, you notice how clear her glasses show up in her nose here and how over here the glasses aren't near as clear and the, the faces have been enhanced. They're better. Then I can go beyond that and I can actually colorize. And this makes it into a picture that's very good. The only problem with it is I know in 1963, my grandmother and my Aunt Lottie both had gray hair. And they've given them brown hair. My, they would bless this program for giving them back their, their light-colored hair instead of their gray. But I know it was really gray at that time. But the pictures really look good because I knew these people. I knew Uncle Aloff, and I, I knew my dad, of course, and these pictures look a lot like them. And so I really love this. Now, one thing you need to remember, whenever you're doing any of these enhancings, whether it was back with photos or here at My Heritage, never replace the original. Always keep the original because that's the real picture. These are now a knockoff, if you want to call it that, from the original. And so you want to save them as a, a copy of the original, but don't replace the original. Keep the original in your file, even if you're not using it for memories, just because you really should have the original. If you throw away all the black and whites and all you have are these colored photos, you don't have the original photos anymore. Whoops, I didn't mean for that to happen. Okay, so, so much for enhancing. Once you've got them all enhanced, 
the way you want them. You've got them fixed up the way you want. You're ready to put them in family search. So sometimes the question from some people is, well, then why are we doing this? Well, the bottom line is we want everybody to see these pictures. We don't want to hoard them and keep them to ourselves. And it's true in every family. There are people all over the place that have pictures, but nobody has them all. This gives us a chance to gather together all the pictures. I think this is so interesting. I have this picture of my second or third great grandmother and two of her, three of her daughters. This is another picture that I think was taken at the very same time because the clothes are the same. These are the three daughters that are over in this picture across the back. But here's a fourth daughter that wasn't in the other photo that I had. And so by being able to go to memories, I know the one I had is in there. Other people have it. But I now see yet another one that has her other daughter. She had four daughters. And now I can see all four of them at the same time and see what they looked like in a picture in time. So the thing that's beautiful about this is we put these in here. Now we don't have to worry about having a fire in our home or a flood or some other disaster that might ruin all of our pictures because we now have digital copies of them that are going to be preserved for everybody. So this is why we're doing this. And by doing this, this is helping turn the hearts of our family because there's nothing like a photo to help turn our hearts. Okay, they often say a photo's worth a thousand words. Well, why don't we put words to our photos? It is possible on every photo in Family Search now in Memories to add a audio file to that memory. This is one that I call the picture in a picture. And I've added a one minute audio. I'm not going to play it tonight. You can go to my grandfather, great grandfather, Alexander Wilkins Jr. and find this picture and listen to it if you want. But the thing is, I've added an audio to explain why dad's picture is in this picture with the family. It's obvious he's passed away. And so this was the way to get the family picture because he was the only one that was gone. Maybe that's partly why they look so somber. Or maybe it was those clamps behind their head that was holding their head still that made them look like this. I don't know. But either way, this is a very somber picture. I think in those days, that was what people did. They didn't smile. They just looked somber. Now, how can you do this? Well, if you go back to the memory app, when you open it up, it's real simple. There's a link there for add audio. The only catch is you don't want to do it at this point because you'll make an audio, but it won't be attached to a picture. If you want to attach it to a picture, what you've got to do first is go to the picture in your gallery. They're showing you your gallery. Click on one of those pictures like there, and then underneath it, you'll see some symbols. I can upload the picture. I can go through here and tag it. I can make a comment about it. And I can make an audio file that goes with it. So all I have to do is just click the microphone. And I will get this screen come up where it says, OK, you want to add an audio to this picture. How do you want to do that? Do you want to record it or do you have a file already made? I'm not that technical, so I would have to record the audio. And what's cool about that, you click on record audio, and then there'll be a thing where you can count down from five to zero, and then you start talking. You'll be allowed to talk up to five minutes, and then it will stop you, or you can stop yourself whenever you want. When you're finished, it's going to say, do you like it? And if you don't like it, you can just delete it and try it again. That's what I tend to do about three or four times every time I try to do one of these pictures because I always mess up. And so it usually takes me two or three, four takes to get a good one. But once you're finished, you save it. It's attached to the photo. 
And that's how you should do it. When you're in the web, when you're on the web version of Family Search, open up the picture. And again, you'll see that little icon down below and you can click on it and add your audio. Okay, videos. We can't put videos in Family Search, but we can put links to videos in memories. We can make a story or a document. You can call it whatever you want. And you can set it up this way so that you can actually link to a video. Now, you're going to have to host the video online. I prefer to use YouTube. I have four or five channels. And so I'll just put it in one of my channels. And then I can get the URL. I can get the little link for that video. And I come over to Family Search. And in this case, it was a story. I made a story. Notice the first word in the story, video. You want people to know this is a video. So put that as the very first word in the title. And then give it a title. This was actually from a family reunion back in 19 or 2022 when we dedicated this stone to my third great grandfather because he never had a stone. And so when we were there, I gave a little presentation about his life while we were standing around the stone prior to the dedication of the grave. And so um, that was recorded by a family member. So we took that recording, made it into a YouTube video. And then I take a little short print, you know, comment down here about what this is, and then put the link here so that people can just do a copy and then paste into the into their web browser into the URL bar, that link, and they can go to the video. That's how you get videos into Family Search since they don't really support it. Okay, it's really easy if you have these videos that you want people to be able to see. Okay, the last thing we wanna talk about today is private and public memories. We have the ability now if you look up here in this corner of this image, to make this image either a public or a private image. Okay, if it's a public memory, every user of Family Search will be able to view it. It'll be viewable by everybody. If it's labeled, you know, it has a title like it has up here, or people are tagged in it, or there are comments down in the description people will be able to search for it and find it. If it's a private memory, then only the person that put it into family search will be able to see it under normal circumstances. And this is usually done because there's something sensitive, like it might be a divorce document or something like that maybe something about a criminal act or a marriage license for a couple that had a child out of wedlock or, you know, all kinds of things that people don't want published. Those are good reasons for having them private. Quite frankly, to me, it would seem like I just wouldn't want to put them in family search. But if you do, then you might not want others to see it, but you want to preserve it. Okay, so you could do that, or it could just be because it's a living person in it. Well, if you mark them private, other people normally aren't going to be able to see it. But there's a problem. Once you die, your private memories will be forever private. Family Search is saying they're going to someday work out a system to make them unprivate down the road somehow. I wouldn't hold my breath waiting for that to happen. So in the meantime, we just have to assume if you die tomorrow, your private memories are not going to be able to be seen by anybody, okay, under normal circumstances. Okay, so I'm going to make some suggestions, and a lot of it pertains to the difference between an, an L, a Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint member's family search account and a public member's family search account. 
there's really these two types of accounts in family search. The big difference is if you have an LDS church member account, when you die, normally you or some family member who's active in the church will go to the ward clerk and say you passed away and they'll go in and they'll mark your membership record as deceased. When that happens, then family search gets notified. Family search goes into your account at family search and tree and it closes down your account as a living account and makes it a deceased account, which is great because now everybody can see that record. But if you have temple reservations, nobody can get in there and make any changes to them. And your memory gallery is now locked and nobody can get into there so that if you have private memories, nobody can access them. Okay, and then of course, all the living people you've created are gonna remain living forever because the church doesn't change living accounts, even if they reach the 110 year point, they just are left as living accounts at this point. So there's some real issues. Now, you could provide your username and password, but you're not supposed to give that to some trusted family member and tell them if you'd pass away, get into my account right away and do something. Well, you know, they're probably not going to be in the mood to do that. And by the time they get around to it, your record will probably already be locked. Now, the difference is for our public members that have accounts, when they pass away, nobody's notifying family search unless the family would happen to go in there and notify them. If the family knows the username and password, that account can continue to be used even though you're gone. Some family member can use it as you, therefore they can get into the gallery and be able to work with the pictures and the documents and the audio and all the things that are in there. And of course the living records will still be ac accessible through that account if somebody has the username and password for that account, which again, family says, family search says you shouldn't do. And I'm saying, you know, sometimes it might be smart to have a family member that can do that. Okay, memories for living people. This is usually the big issue. Memories for living people can safely be uploaded to family search. At one time they said you shouldn't do it. Now they're saying you can do it, just beware, be careful. And so people can't search for a living person's picture unless you put their name in the title. The titles can be searched or in the description because the descriptions can be searched. When you go and uh, tag them, like I've tagged my daughter Amy here, the tags can't be searched because she's a living person. Her living record that I have of her is not searchable. So it's okay to tag her because I'm the only person that can see the tag. What I don't want to do is put her name up in here or down in there because then it can be searched. Okay, also beware that if you put a picture with a living person in there, in an album, that album, if it's avail if it's not marked private, even if this picture is private, if it's in that album and the album's not private, you're gonna find that people will be able to see that picture. Also, this picture is tagged to my father. He's the only deceased person in this picture. Well, if you go to my father, you will see this picture. The only thing you won't see is you won't see the tags here for the living people. The only people that be tagged in here that you'll see, the only person that will be tagged here is my dad. But my family is there. And the one thing they do say, if you're going to put living people in tree, if they're your children, you don't have to ask permission, but for anybody else that's living, you really should ask their permission before you put them in there. 
But just beware, there's some things you got to do to be careful. I took and did a whole bunch of pictures of Amy in tree and I put them in a folder and I accidentally, I labeled the folder, Amy Lynn Gibbons. And I went into search in the general gallery for family search and went out and said, I want to look in the whole tree for Amy Lynn Gibbons. All the pictures in that photo album came up, even though none of the pictures have her name because they were in an album that said Amy Lynn Gibbons. Then all those pictures suddenly became searchable. So what I did is I changed the name of the album to ALG. And that's the, the name of it. That way it's not an obvious name and it won't come up if you search for Amy Lynn Givens or Amy Ward or anything like that because it's just those three initials. Okay, so now I have some solutions. I, I give you some options for what you can do if you really want to put living people's pictures in tree and you want down the road for those pictures to be usable by people. Okay, because you've seen the issues. When a member of the church passes away, the account's closed, it's made public, and but you can no longer get into the memories. If you're a public member and you pass away, if nobody has a way to get into that account, then you can't get to the images either. So let's talk about options here. One is you can upload your memories of living people and make them private. That's probably the worst thing you can do. If you're gonna do that, I don't know why you're even gonna put them in there. If you're just gonna leave them totally at private and not do anything beyond that, because once you're gone, nobody's gonna know they're there. And you've really accomplished nothing. Now, nobody can see them. You're gone. You're the only person that could see them. There's no way to share them now. Or you can upload your memories of living people, make them public, and possibly put them in albums. Okay, why do I say that? Well, if you have a trusted family member or two that you don't think are going to share this with the world, if you put them in albums, and they know the name of the album to search for, they will then have access to those private images. Because you can put the images in that album. And then when anybody that has a way to know what the name of the album is, they need to find, if they can find that album, they can then see all the images. The trouble with this is, the only thing they're going to be able to do with those images is take them one by one and download them onto their computer and then re-upload them into Family Search if they want to use them. There's going to be a lot of labor involved. And so you see, that's not really a totally good solution to the problem. Because, you know, first place, you got to remember to do this, and then you've got to hope that your family member doesn't lose the list wherever they wrote it down of the albums that you want them to be able to access. And if they forget what albums they are, then this whole thing's not going to work. Okay, if you want to know the absolute worst thing you can do, no matter who you are, LDS or non-LDS, is upload these pictures, leave them in your gallery, don't tag anybody, don't title anybody, don't put a description in there and mark them private. And I guarantee you they're gonna be lost forever. And nobody's gonna have a clue what's there because there's absolutely no way to find those. And they're now frozen in time once you're gone. That's the worst thing you can do. You've got to do something. The steps up above one and two are better than absolutely doing nothing. But those first two options, I don't think are very good. The one that's gonna get me in trouble is what I'm gonna suggest now. And this is go and create a public account. Now, if you're a non-LDS person, you're in good shape. You've already got the public account. 
For the rest of us, we're going to create a second account to use at Family Search. And we're not going to link it to our family search to our, our church membership record because we can't. You only have one account that's associated with your record number. So you're going to create a public account. And you're going to go back in and add your living family members into this account so that you can see them with this account. And then you can upload your photos like I've done to say your children. You can put hundreds of them in there if you want. This could be your storage for your family. And just upload all these pictures without any, you know, title, without any description. And but tag to your child or your relative. And, um, you know, so that they're attached to that person and leave them there. Now, the only real thing you need to do is make sure that people have your username and password for that account so that once you're gone, they can go in there. So before you die, you share your username and password. The big no-no. But you do that so that after you're gone, your family can go in there and operate that account just like it's you. And now they have the actual access to these records. There are these images, these documents, these uh, audio files, whatever you happen to have. And they have absolute access to them. And they can turn them public if they want. Like if one of the kids dies, they can go in and they can mark all the photos for that child as public now, merge that living record, make that living record a deceased record and merge it in with their primary record and all their images are tied in. That's the solution I would recommend. Now, I, this isn't my idea by myself. I've actually done some research on this. I've, I've run across a guy that I'm, I'm friends with online, Dennis Yancey. And Dennis is a pretty, pretty sharp character. He does a lot of different things in family search. He's a real good user of it, heavy user of it, understands how it works. He's done a heavy study on this. And you can go this Yancey family genealogy.org is a blog. And you can go to it and go to when you pass away the article called When You Pass Away, and there's little underlines between the words there. That's why there are spaces. And you can read an extensive article that talks about this and take, get his take on this. This is where I got a lot of my information, and I think this will work good. You know, like I say, this is just my opinion of how to do things. Don't need to do it, but I think it's something you need to think about so that down the road you have a way to handle this situation and not lose a lot of the stuff that you may have put into tree that now is not going to be available to people. Okay, questions. I appreciate your uh, patience.